and it has a tone. No thanks. What tone is? Tone to F. And these are limestone boxes, much smaller. Those are human size. This is bigger. And those do not have a tone. But the granite does. So here at Karnak, if you look at all of these huge columns, you notice that they're made out of a number of different pieces and that is manageable by a working crew. However, right next to it we have an obelisk. This obelisk is basically of the same scale but it's composed of one piece of stone. This is much more of a challenge than that from a technical viewpoint. Also this material is local. This is from the quarry at Aswan. So the theory is that the obelisk has nothing to do with the dynastic Egyptian culture. The dynastic Egyptians built all of these incredible limestone and sandstone buildings, but that's from another older culture who had the capability to work on that kind of scale of one single block, hewing it out from the bedrock, moving it, shaping it, erecting it. This could be a receiving station of the energy from the pyramids, if the pyramids were energy power plants. It's like what Tesla was trying to achieve and did achieve. He reinvented a very ancient process. So even the geologists have agreed, who are here, that something very strange happened to this black stone because the core of it is more unstable than the surface. The crystal size in the core is bigger than the outside surface. And some theorize, again, that this was part of an energy system. Energy was running through the stone, and possibly there was a giant burst of energy that went through it, destabilized it, and basically caused this stone and others here at Karnak to explode thousands of years before the dynastic times. Okay. Okay, this is in the Temple of Osiris at Abydos, and we're going to now talk about the world famous glyphs that have been found here that some people think are helicopters, submarines, etc. Up on the upper wall, up there. Now, I actually knew the person who started the craze. Her name was Dr. Ruth Hover, bless her memory. Uh, 1998, 1988, she took a picture of that, and it went viral. And everybody's picked it up, including the ancient aliens crowd, saying it's proof of aliens, this and that, and this and that. But there's a scientific archaeological way to explain that. If carefully looked at, one will see that there is an overlaying glyph on top. Oh, glyphs were laid over what was originally there. It is in archaeology called a palimpsest. Uh, actually, archaeology has borrowed the term. Uh, it's P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-T, if people want to Google it. And it has to do with being overlaid with something underneath. The key how Hakim explained it, whether one wants to believe they're helicopters or not, he, if, as we've spoken, everything in Kemet was a duality. What was on one side was on the other side. So Hakim said what would be on the east wall would be on the west wall. What's on the north wall would be on the south wall. If we go here and we look what's up there, we see it's the normal cartouches of Hamsi. No helicopters, no airplanes, no nothing. It would have to be there if it was original. And, it is and this is, as you can see here, this is the normal level of land. We're actually walking downstairs in order to enter the Osirian, which is a surreal megalithic structure. It's not just a grand ancient work of engineering, it's just off the charts in terms of what it is, and I'll show you.
These are the bits and pieces of one of the largest sculptures ever created on the planet. That is a finger. This is the kneecap. There you see the feet, and there you see the torso. The weight of the sculpture is estimated as having been 1,000 tons when it was in one piece. The quarry is 200 kilometers away, and so the block from which it was carved would have to have been at least 1,200 or 1,400 tons. The question is, was it carved in place in Aswan and moved here, or was it was the block moved here and then carved? And we are reasonably far from the Nile, so how was it transported 200 kilometers? Well, here we are again at the Aswan Quarry, where we have the famous unfinished obelisk. And that is different stories about the cracks that we see on the surface. Um, there's supposedly an attempt during dynastic times to cut this, but I think these marks here are modern cuts. But for sure that there were modern earthquakes that did this. This is not the reason they stopped this. The crack, as uh, you know, because you went in there last year, is on the underside. So they're undercutting this with every intention of raising it, and they find there's a natural crack on the underside. So they know it will not go to resonance, so they left it. And as uh, our, 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 our Egyptologist and tour guide, Muhammad Ibrahim, has said, it appears that this could have been pre-cataclysmic, that they were doing this work and the cataclysm could have stopped the work. It's, and we'll have definite proof of that when we go to the other obelisk in the back, that it was not cracked, there was no reason for them to leave it there, leave it there. they should have finished it, and it just stopped immediately. We believe that was the cataclysm that stopped the work. As you can see, the weathering on the body is much greater than the weathering on the head. And basically, only the head has been exposed uh, for uh, any significant amount of time. Usually the body has been covered in sand. So how can you explain that the body is more heavily eroded than the head is? And the, really, the only logical explanation for that is the fact that the head has been recarved at least once, if not many times, because the proportions are way off. The body of the Sphinx, including the tail, uh, the feet and, and the torso, etc., are in reasonably good proportion with one another, but the head is much, much smaller. So on this trip with the Kemet School in April of 2014, we have seen extensive numbers of different sites, um, all the way from Aswan in the south up to here in Cairo and farther north. Now what I've noticed distinctly is that here, around the Giza Plateau area, you have actual pyramids, but farther south, um, you don't have them. You have a number of beautiful dynastic temples, etc. So what separates the Giza Plateau area historically, from the Comitian perspective, from all of the so-called dynastic sites? Yes, wonderful question. You have so much history and prehistory here, overlays of different cultures, different cultures, different cultures. But this is documented in my book, The Land of Osiris. This is what Hakim wanted to say was the oldest area. Kemet was the civilization. Kemet is all that we've seen. Kemet even was all of Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, all the way through what we call today some parts of Asia to Europe. But he always wanted to concentrate on what he called Boo Wizard, The Land of Osiris. And that's the sites from Dashur in the south to Abu Dawash in the north. And of course includes Giza and Saqqara. So what we see here is the oldest of the old. And this is why this is so important, so great. But we are finding too now that even the rest of Egypt today, or the dynastic period, may have had pyramids too. The son of Abdel Hakim, who has followed in his path the most, is Yusuf Abdel Hakim Awiyan. Yusuf believes he, he has found evidence of a pyramid maybe at Karnak maybe in the south. So there may have been pyramids too. We have seen what we call Middle Kingdom pyramids at the area of Fayum with al Harada, uh, uh, and many other sites that had pyramids too. But he wanted to concentrate on this area of sites from Dashur to Saqqara to Abu Siyu and Abu Jurab to Zawiyat al-Ariyan to Giza and to Abu Ruwash. 
that was all one site at one time, 25 square miles, all had pyramids, all had temples, all connected with underground water channels, all one site. And what we've seen and what we discover all the time is more of these area, like going to the Serapium, like every time you have gone to Abu Sir, you continue to see more things. These sites, we're only scratching the surface, we're only in kindergarten in the Kemet school. More things will be found under the sand. One of the things that we, us, and Hakim, only things we would agree with Zahi Hawass about when he would say we've only discovered 18% which is under the sand. We agree. There's so much more that will be found that will be even older, perhaps, what we're seeing. Older temples, more pyramids to be found. Abdel Hakim said there were originally nine large pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Not three and six satellites we see today makes nine. Nine large pyramids. We have discovered the possible fourth. There is another fifth that he has told us where to look for. There is much, much more to be found. But this is the most ancient of sites. It is what attracted you, Brian, why you can't get enough of the Giza Plateau, Abu Sir, Sicada, the, the Serapium. This is the ancient of the ancient. The most finest machining, the incredible boxes in stone, uh, uh, all the things we see, pyramids and temples and water tunnels. You've been under the Giza Plateau with Yusuf. He's taken you down three layers. It goes down at least 300 meters. Tunnels upon tunnels, all were constructed before anything above ground to bring the water from the west to here to the Nile Valley, to use the water for sound and for energy. And what uh, common words in English do we have that are derived most likely from Boo Wizard? Boo Wizard. A lot of people want to say Osiris it was our, was our, but he would always say Wizard. Where comes the word wisdom? Where comes the word wizard?